Do you ever feel like it's harder to raise kids today than in years or even decades past? Kids don't have freedom. Parents' whole day is taken up. And that really is a family-unfriendly dynamic. There's a good argument that despite some policy changes at the state or national level across the country in recent years, American culture has actually become more family-unfriendly. But the good news is there might be a way to fix it. We sit down with Tim Carney to discuss his new book on the topic. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Defending Ideas is a weekly podcast produced by Sutherland Institute. On this show, we are committed to renewing the principles of common sense conservatism, making you a better champion of sound ideas. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. I'm your host, Nick Dunn. And this week, we're talking about families and family policy, but also just how our culture and our society treats family formation and the upbringing of children. And the key question is this, is it harder to raise a family today than it was in years past? And what can we do about it if that's the case? Joining us now is Tim Carney to help answer that question. Tim is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and also a senior columnist for the Washington Examiner. And he's the author of the brand new book, Family Unfriendly, from HarperCollins, and also a book that you can access in audiobook form on Amazon at Barnes & Noble. And we want to talk through some of the arguments that you've made in that book, Tim, specifically to help our audience, whether they are parents themselves, if they're prospective parents, or considering whether or not they even want to get married and have kids, and also for public policy implications. So, Tim, first of all, just thank you for joining us and spending some time here on Defending Ideas. Thank you for having me. So, Tim, I want to jump into the arguments you make in the book because it's been fascinating going through it. And I, I want to kind of ask you this question first, that it seems that in recent years, so many of our conversations about family policy have focused on things like paid family leave, subsidized child care, things like that. And as those policies have become more common, one might think that, well, aren't we getting more family friendly as a country, as a society, because we're implementing more of these policies? But it seems that the argument in your book is that, no, we're actually becoming less family friendly. So to start off, can you help explain for our listeners why do you think America is actually becoming a less family-friendly place? Well, we're, we're family-unfriendly in expectations on parents. We're family-unfriendly. Our, our mating and dating culture is broken. You know, the apps, I think, have broken the way people interact, but also on our values. And so the policies you're talking about there, uh, uh, paid, uh, subsidized daycare, what the experiment in Northern Europe, for instance, showed us, they went and they saw, okay, wait a second, our birth rates are falling. A lot of this has to do with the fact that mothers are, have to take time away from work in order to spend time with their family. And so that trade-off, they're saying, was bad for the economy and bad for the family formation. So if we subsidize childcare, we should be able to get more birth, both. That didn't happen. They subsidized childcare and they did subsidize work but they also shifted the family, the culture's value. So in, in lots of Northern Europe where they subsidized childcare, they found that people started valuing family less and valuing work more. Now, other countries have gone ahead and they've subsidized, just given money straight to parents, like you know a, a child allowance, a child tax credit. That hasn't uh, quite moved the values in a pro-family direction, but it has economically soften the blow. So there's a lot to discuss on sort of federal, level, national level, child policy that has to do with large amounts of money. But the bottom line is the culture is what's determinative. If you subsidize parents in a way that's pro-work, they will become less pro-family. If you subsidize parents in a way that's pro-family, you might be able to move them a little bit, but still the other cultural effects will be really determinative. So why do you think, when, when you've looked at this, and you, and you looked at tons of data and research, you talked to families all across the country for your book, why do you think that our culture has become more family unfriendly over the years? What are some of the factors that you found? So as I said, the parenting inputs are, have gone crazy. The 50 years ago, the mothers worked outside of the home a lot less, and dads actually chipped in on taking care of kids a lot less. Nowadays, mothers are working outside of the home more. Dads are putting in twice the amount of time, according to time use surveys, of just taking care of kids. So 
That means driving them to and from practice, helping with homework. So what has happened with mother's time? They now spend 50% more time on parenting. Now, at first it sounds good, but then you look at childhood anxiety and parental stress and you realize, wait a second, a huge source of childhood anxiety is a lack of independent play. But every kid is getting driven from you know school to extracurricular to a sports team home, doing dinner under supervision. Kids don't have freedom. Parents' whole day is taken up. And that really is a family unfriendly dynamic. The rise in childhood anxiety is right there along with parental stress and the falling birth rates as a big indicators that something is wrong with our culture. And again, I could go into the why people are getting married later, and that's a cultural effect. I could go into how smartphones are affecting children. That's not just a tech story. That's a culture story. And again, ultimately, the, the, our culture's values really are not family-oriented as, as a broad culture. One of the things I do in Family Unfriendly is I go and I explore more family-friendly subcultures, including you know, places that are, are LDS. Uh, the church is, is playing a huge role in Utah, in Idaho, including Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods, including my own sort of social circles of uh, more conservative Catholics. We have six kids, my wife and I. We have a lot of friends like that. And in those places, you see difference. You see less childhood anxiety and more big families. One of the things you write about in your book is this idea of the travel team trap. And, and when you talk about, as you just mentioned, this, this finding of, you know, it's, it's something that's so common that we talk about now, the rise of, of mental health challenges for the younger generation, anxiety, depression, and, and you've mentioned some of the factors at play. But, but I'm really interested in this idea of sort of this boom of over-engaged parenting where, where essentially they're becoming too engaged, too involved, one of the core concepts you mentioned that might seem counterintuitive, kind of surprising in your book is telling parents, hey, have lower ambitions for your kids when it comes to sort of this excellence culture. And, and you use sports as a good reference for that, even though it applies to a number of different things. And and I was reading this, I'm thinking of my own upbringing. When I was a kid, you know, I grew up playing Little League and basketball and, and football and different things. But then in high school, I realized I wasn't that good at anything else, and I actually really liked swimming the most. And so then I did specialize, and I did club swimming year-round all through my high school years. Um, and so I'm thinking, what, did, did I make a mistake specializing in club swimming? You know, have, I, have I harmed myself long-term? That's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. But, <laughs> but, but talk, talk through that. I mean, what's, what did you find as far as this hyper-specialization of kids early on where that is actually leading to some negative outcomes for kids and parents. Sure. I looked at lots of studies and I looked at the, the studies of studies and found that the specialization for children, for teenagers in a sport is uh, really associated with bad outcomes physically and emotionally. And there's a lot of people who they will specialize just because there's only one thing they like to do. But if you do it year round, it actually can harm your body, if you're not cross-training, if you're not resting, it can interfere with family culture. That's a big problem. I've had multiple friends tell me, I wish that the swim team did not dictate our family's calendar. I wish that you know we could have family dinner when we wanted to have family dinner instead of when the swim coach said we could have family dinner. It also psychologically is harming kids in that you have, they, they not only sort of are sadder, well, they have less fun because they're they're not you know running around the neighborhood hanging out with their friends, but also they have a lower opinion of their own ability because some sort of specialization, not all of it, but some takes a form of you're really climbing the ladder. It's super intensive. You're playing in these tournaments. You're trying to get on the all star team of the all star teams, and then at some point you realize, wait a second, I spent my whole life being a tennis player, and I'm the one hundredth best girl tennis player in my own county. And that can be really depressing. It's good for people to sort of, it's good for kids to fail and to encounter somebody who's much better than them. But it's bad for that to happen if they've attached their own net worth, their own personal value to this one activity. So that's one of the big dangers of specialization. A big problem is that a lot of institutions, cultural institutions, encourage specialization. A JV baseball coach who says, well, if you want to try out for the team, you got to play travel year round. You can't play soccer and baseball because you need to play fall baseball too. 
And so that's a real way that I think institutions need to change and they need to promote diversity, promote an expansive childhood rather than an intensive childhood. With that concept of an expansive childhood, I think one of the big themes from your book is this idea that chi- the purpose of childhood is maybe contested in some ways today, that this sort of the travel team trap or this push for elitism and excellence among minors so that, well, they need to get into a good school, get good, good scholarships, and it's very much this outcome-based, you know, hierarchical excellence culture that we're sort of inadvertently pushing our kids towards, or I guess explicitly pushing our kids towards. Do you think it's it's safe to say that should we instead reorient our society to say that, look, the purpose of childhood is to help kids grow up to be good, well-rounded people with a variety of healthy experiences, and that means that if they do sort of focus on one sport, if it's because they just love it and they want to get better at it and they find joy in the activity, as opposed to, again, it's a source of achieving excellence— is that sort of a shift that needs to happen? Yeah. So I tell a story sort of on myself in in chapter one, where there is one game, my son, we let him try out for a travel sport, a uh, travel team in baseball, and it was a big mistake. The first thing the coach said is, uh, baseball isn't fun. Winning baseball is fun. If family unfriendly has a bad guy, like it's, <laughs> he's he's the first bad guy in the book. But then I'm the next bad guy because one point my the, my boys team has a lead. It's the last inning. First guy hits a ground ball to my son at shortstop. Easy ball. He just bobbles it. Kid reaches base. Next few kids reach base. Boom. The lead collapses. We lose. The other team celebrates. And so I go to bed thinking, man, maybe, maybe I just need to hit him more grounders. He just needs more reps. And then the next day, son's still out after January. says, dad, let's go out back. Hit me fly balls. It's like, you know what? Why don't we drive over to the element to the high school? They've got a good infield. I can hit you grounders. He's like, you can just hit me fly balls, you know, in the in the field behind our house. Let's do that. And I started arguing with him. And finally he said, Dad, fly balls are just more fun. <laughs> I realized what had happened. My son had asked me to have a catch with him, to play with him. And I was trying to turn it into a training session. And so that was I had adopted subconsciously this achievement oriented idea of childhood instead of this fun, dad, son, fun. So he was proposing family and fun and activity. And I was saying no to it because it didn't fit into my, what is the specific achievement he needs now for the specific task at hand? So how do you translate that into advice for parents? And to give a little context, I want to share a story. I might've mentioned this in previous episodes, but so, so, so my wife and I, we have two little boys at home. And so we're still kind of in, in the first few years of, of the parenting adventure. And w- one of the things you talk about in your book and you allude to is this idea of how becoming a parent fundamentally changes certain things for you as, as an individual, how you view your family, society, the future in very important and I think constructive ways. And a few years ago, it was right after my wife and I found out that we were expecting our first. And at, for the place I was working at the time, one of my colleagues... We were having a planning meeting about some long-term you know, public policy initiatives we were working on. And he asked me, he's like, Nick, when you think of Utah 10 years from now, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And I knew he was fishing for some kind of public policy answer. I'm like, well, our transportation infrastructure needs this, or this is what we need for our economy. Like, Because that was the context. It's a policy conversation. But because I had just found out that I was going to be a dad soon, the first thing that came to mind was, well, hang on, about 10 years from now, I'm going to have a 10-year-old son. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for what I want my state and country to be for him? And it totally shifted everything. And so one of those first big buckets of your book is, to be honest, I was kind of surprised that it, it, the, a lot of it felt like more of a, a parenting guide, sort of advice for parents. And then you get into some policy stuff later. But So I want to ask you first, based on what you found in your research and your interviews, what advice would you give to parents to help us become a more family-friendly culture? Well, certainly, I would I would say you have to start by questioning and interrogating culture's expectations of you. Who is making the rule that you have to put your kid in the best sport? Who is trying to tell you that you should sign up for My Baby Can Read? And what is their understanding of your child? Versus if you're informed, as, as I am, my wife and I were Catholic, if you're informed by 
faith? Do you have a particular anthropology? Is the advice you're getting coming from somebody who has the same view or is it coming from somebody with a, a materialistic viewpoint or a ultimately negative view of human being? So once you start with that question, it, it helps you address better things. The other one I would say is, um, I quote Mike Tyson in Family Unfriendly, and I say, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, which is to say, understand all of your plans as uh, as tentative. All of your plans are contingent on things going the way you plan. Every child in history has been unplanned in a way in that they're not the people we think they're going to be. Every child is an individual and they're different. I was surprised when I started to have two and three kids that they were so different from one another. I thought they'd all have the same personality. I thought that would work with one would work with another. Now it's it's laughable that I thought that, but I really did believe it after one kid when number two was on the way. And so just that ability to be flexible, then suddenly you find that you're you're open to life. You're open to chaos. You're open to unpredictability. And while at first that might bug you if you're a planner type, you realize what what are the real joys in life? If, if you went to college, why was college so fun? It's because you would just unexpectedly bump into your friends. They were just there. The, the sort of chance encounters are often the things that add the most to our day. Walking down the street and hearing a bird singing when you haven't even been thinking about it, that's the sort of thing that cheers you up. Children in your life, if you let them, they become that. One of the, the quotes I, I have in the book is, going for a walk with a four-year-old is like going for a walk with William Blake. Suddenly the world is just so much more alive in ways that you never notice. So just being open to that and sort of setting aside some of your own uh, self image as, as a planner or a drill sergeant, that would be the advice for parents I would give. Tim, it seems like it's, it's sort of reminding folks, and I think a, a huge chunk of your book does this, Again, it doesn't start out as here's a, a policy agenda. It starts out with this this idea of advice for parents, which in some ways is encouraging because parents can relax a little bit. But we don't need to be so, you know, worried about every little thing or focused on again excellence for our kid. Just focus on the broad fundamentals: are they safe and healthy and loved, and are we raising them to have good experiences to become well-rounded adults that can contribute well to to society, kind of thing. But again, within those broad parameters, there's this sort of relax kind of message almost. But also I think that there's a big takeaway I had going through it was it's a really good reminder of what's actually really important at the end of the day. And, you know, my wife and I talk about how with our kids, we, we want them to grow up knowing that they are loved by us, by God, that we love each other, that we love each other as a family. And essentially, if we have those basic fundamentals, everything else will probably be okay. And sometimes it's it's easier said than done. But something you just mentioned, this idea of you know going a walk with a going on a walk with a child, the things that, that that they point out, the things that stand out to them that remind them and remind you as a parent of what's most important in life, when you can really strip away all the stuff we freak out about in society and on social media, it is this reminder of that family institution being so essential. And and I want to ask you about how that actually does translate into public policy, because it's one thing to say, well, my wife and I as parents and how we raise our kids, we can recognize that our, our family is the most important thing, our, our faith and our family, the most important two things in our life. But if it feels like society doesn't prioritize those things in the, some way, in the same way, what can we do about it? So what advice would you give to policymakers to help make America more family friendly and push back against some of these negative trends? Again, I would tell policymakers to start with a, a mindset and, in fact, a bias in favor of families. Uh, Pope Francis often talks about uh, having a preferential option for the poor when he's talking about social teaching, which is to say, let's not treat everybody equal. Let's actually have favorites. <laughs> and our favorites should be the babies and little kids and, incidentally, parents. And so that is a little provocative. It's a, it cuts against some of the ideas of sort of a liberal pluralistic democracy where we treat everybody equally. But the word equity has been coming up these days more on sort of the, the left side of the political spectrum. But the idea of equity is that some people need accommodation, a special accommodation. And if you have someone in your family who has a disability or you know your parent or grandparent who's elderly, 
you you don't just treat them equally. You might go and you you, you buy a ramp for the wheelchair. You you hold their hand. You give them the easiest seat to sit down in. And our culture policymakers should be accommodating to families. One thing that that Utah has done, I, I don't know on what level, but I've seen a push to reduce the, no, the amount of homework, especially for younger kids. That's a pro-family move. Will it possibly reduce some academic achievement? Maybe, maybe not. But they put family first is what they did. Another thing I look at infrastructure. Some places don't have sidewalks. And if you build sidewalks, you might make the street narrower. You might chop down trees. But guess what? Kids need to be able to walk and they shouldn't be walking in the road when they can avoid it. And so building sidewalks, you're, you're picking winners and losers. You're picking children over trees or kids over cars. And that's the right way to go. So the, the most important thing I can really think of, if anybody, you know, any mayor or town council asks for advice, is build an infrastructure of family. Bike paths, sidewalks, playgrounds. Not to make it easier for the hipsters to get to, you know, their local coffee shop, but to make it easier for the kids to visit their friends, to start their own pickup game of basketball, take down the sign that says, you know, uh, you can only play here if you have a permit and, and really build an infrastructure of family. That's what I would do on the, on the local level. And on the national level too, ask yourself, how can we side with families? So for instance, building more homes. So a lot of people worry if more homes are built here, will that increase traffic? Will What will that do to these other public amenities? And then you realize that in so much of the country, the only way in which it's really become less affordable for millennials and Gen Z to start families is that in the last three years, the price of homes have gone way up. So some people will suffer a little if you build a lot more homes, but if you build a lot more single family, duplex homes, starter homes, more people will start families. Be biased in favor of families. Tim, that's something that's been a high topic of conversation here in Utah and I think around the country. But here at Southern London Institute, we just released some new survey data where we asked likely voters in Utah, what are the top issues that are on your mind that are going to influence how you vote this election year? And across the board, the number one issue is housing affordability. And I think that feeds into what you're saying is just there's a lot of stress. That was what our, our previous episode was about um, with one of your colleagues, Beth Akers from AEI, who's a contributor for us here is this idea of, well, when will it be affordable for me to be able to own a home? And I think so much of that anxiety is anchored to, I want to be able to raise a family here in Utah and exactly. have the number of kids that I want. But housing prices seem like an obstacle. And so you talk a lot about in your book about housing regulations, about zoning. You actually mentioned Daybreak in South Jordan, Utah, as an example of, of maybe some things we could learn. Are there any key takeaways that you would suggest for policymakers and communities to help our, our housing, zoning, regulation, infrastructure, anything specific to help it be more family friendly? Well, so, I mean, there's some deeper level urbanism research that I haven't done that I would encourage policymakers to look into, which is to say, again, what is the sort of family friendly housing? Large apartment buildings, lots of density, density in the abstract is good, but large apartment buildings are not actually, they don't build community. People don't actually know their neighbors in large apartment buildings, and it's it's not as as family oriented. So, what is the best sort of density that provides uh, good situations for family? Maybe it's garden apartments. Maybe it's a certain type of garden apartment. Do you have regulations that make it too costly, uneconomical for builders to build starter homes? My wife and I now we're looking for a home. We're not looking for a starter home. We have six kids. <laughs> we unfortunately need something big, but we were so grateful and so lucky to be able to. When we were expecting, number one, buy a house that was under a thousand square feet, but had its own backyard. That was exactly what we needed. And then we eventually finished the basement when our kids were playing around. That sort of entry level thing, that's one of the things that the combination of the economics and the regulation make impossible. Tim, in, in a couple of minutes that we have left, I, I want to kind of finish with, with the idea of, of workplace policies, because something that has been so common in these conversations is... Yeah, and, and you talk about this in your book and in some of your uh, public speaking engagements and writings that we sort of, as a society, have begun to view children as obstacles to full parental workforce participation, as opposed to viewing children as assets, where essentially if, if you view parental time with kids as a barrier to economic progress, as opposed to viewing parental time with kids as an asset for strong families, that seems kind of backwards to me. So I want to finish by asking... 
what advice would you give to employers or to all of us when we think about workplace-related family-friendly policies? What's a true pro-family agenda in the workplace? Well, so make sure you're not trying to build work-friendly families, which is a term I borrowed from Richard Reeves of Brookings, but instead trying to build family-friendly workplaces. And so, you know, while a lot of people will talk about subsidized childcare, you know, maybe on-site ch- subsidized childcare really helps. That helps parents spend time with their kids, but that's not where I would start or end. The first thing is just an accommodating attitude and flexibility towards parents. If somebody has a lot of employers will give you a day off to go build houses for Habitat for Humanity, which is great. But they should also say, okay, you you can leave early. Tell us what your real family obligations are. What do you value? It's being at your son's first uh, lacrosse game, at your daughter's uh, first softball game, et cetera. And so that sort of flexibility is part of it. Also, just setting, making it clear from the top down, family matters more. I've always had bosses, whether at the Washington Examiner or AEI, that told me that. They told me that family matters more. If you say that, and then even just little things that make that clear. And in the book, again, I've got half a chapter full of recommendations for employers. Little things that make it clear that you say that and you believe that. That will build loyalty among your employees. So it's it's good from a capitalistic perspective. But it's also the right thing to do because the alternative is that you as an employer are dragging people away from a higher calling which is fatherhood, motherhood, and marriage. Well, Tim, we want to thank you for your time. We know you have a hard stop and you've been very generous with us today, but thank you so much. The book is Family Unfriendly. The author is Tim Carney from the American Enterprise Institute and a Washington Examiner. Tim, thank you so much. We encourage folks to go out and buy the book and read it and figure out how we can adopt these ideas into our society to become more family-friendly moving forward. Tim, thanks so much for being with us on Defending Ideas. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Stick around. Sutherland Institute is an independent, nonprofit public policy think tank based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Our mission is to defend the principles of the American founding and strengthen the institutions of civil society essential for those principles to endure. Sutherland provides research, events, and multimedia to policymakers and the public to promote the principles of faith, family, freedom, opportunity, and responsibility. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. Before we keep talking about some of the key takeaways from Tim's book and the discussion with him, I want to mention, if you like what you're hearing today, please visit defendingideas.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at Sutherland Institute to get more access to videos like this and also from previous episodes. And also don't forget to subscribe to Defending Ideas on any of the major podcast platforms, wherever you like to get your shows, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, basically wherever you listen. Search for Defending Ideas and hit that subscribe button and share it with a friend. Encourage others to subscribe and listen and watch the program as well. So there's a few things that stood out to me from the conversation with Tim that I wanted to capture in some notes that I think we can use as talking points as we move forward having conversations about this in our own lives with our elected officials and with our friends and neighbors. One of the biggest things that stood out to me is that I think what Tim is arguing and what resonates with me is that too much of our modern society is really kind of asking families to bend themselves around other institutions in our society, things like work, school, We talked with Tim about school sports and and the travel team trap, Um, but then even things like transportation infrastructure, that if we don't have communities and neighborhoods specifically that are conducive to young kids walking and biking around to make friends and interact with other families, that can be detrimental as well. So what we should be doing is discussing how these other institutions or or aspects of our modern society can actually become more family-friendly themselves rather than the other way around. And that's because there's this key principle, I think, from Tim's research and writing and from many of our conversations on the show, that family is really in so many ways the most important, most fundamental, foundational institution of civil society for our state and our nation. And because of that, we need to make sure that the way we talk about these things is oriented toward that priority. A really good example of this concept comes from a previous Defending Ideas episode with Catherine Stevens. Let's play that clip. 
is it safe to say that we need to reorient the vision as a society towards, look, the institution of the family is very, very important. If every attempt at quote-unquote family-friendly policy is only trying to improve the other institutions that are tangential to the actual family, are we missing the institution itself of parents and kids? Yeah, exactly. And to your point earlier about the Build Back Better uh, bill and um, the other initiatives that are describing early education and care, child care as essential infrastructure, the essential infrastructure of society and most certainly the the essential infrastructure for young children is the family. I think one of the key things from that is that, again, we're sort of reorienting the discussion to say that if we agree that the essential infrastructure, as Catherine said, is the family, then that institution itself needs to be a focal point of a lot of our efforts as a society, as a community, and sometimes with respect to public policy as well. That if we're only just focusing on sort of the other institutions and not the family itself, we're missing some important opportunities. And relative to that is another conversation from a previous episode touching on the topic of how we build communities and how that makes a difference. So in in another previous episode, we spoke with Jenna Erickson about some of the recommendations from the U.S. Surgeon General with respect to family policy. It was looking more so through the lens of loneliness and how to combat the epidemic of loneliness. And so there are a number of things from a report that we mentioned in this clip we're about to watch that touches on some of these sort of built environment aspects. You may have heard that term before. It just refers to things like parks, roads, schools, our infrastructure, those kinds of things. And those are important, but also it might miss some crucial things. And Jenna Erickson had some really good insights on that point. Some of the recommendations that the Surgeon General offers are things like strengthening social infrastructure, which is things like parks, libraries, or public programs. Um, They talk about pro-connection policies, such as public transportation or paid family leave, talk about health care, Um, They also talk about digital environments, but then um, also talk about cultivating a culture of connection. So there's kind of a variety of things in there that they recommend, Right. but it it seems like there was something missing at its core. And and you and I talked Mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Can you expand on maybe where this assessment is right, but maybe more importantly, what is it missing that we need to bring to the conversation as far as how do we actually address this epidemic of loneliness? Yes, thank you. It's so interesting because his examples in his book um, together where he addresses addresses this, Surgeon General Vivek Murphy, the examples he uses actually go back to his own family. <laughs> and what you hear missing in all the suggestions that you gave, and certainly parks and libraries and and emphasizing connection and human interaction, right, in a technoference world uh, is important. But what it's missing is the reason parks and libraries and all those things have meaning at all for human beings is because of deeply core relationships. So we know the people that are voting, the people that care about libraries, the people that care about parks, their families who are concerned about the well-being of their children. And that gets us connected to the broader community. So I would say first it pulls us out into caring about many other things when we are married and have children. But then it also provides the structure for our own flourishing and sense of meaning and identity. A concern about the future, a concern about the well-being of others is is grounded in the strength of those core relationships. And he just doesn't, he doesn't reference those as an important kind of way to ameliorate, even though it's the foundation of the way to ameliorate loneliness. I think one of the big takeaways from that clip from a previous episode is that, the again, the physical environment, the neighborhoods, all of the things we talked about in terms of infrastructure and resources for families, those all matter and those are, those are important. But it's the actual relationships themselves that are the most important. The, again, the family institution itself, parental time with kids is a huge asset with respect to this. Parental time together the, in a two-parent married household, all of those kinds of things, we need to make sure that we don't forget the importance of those actual human relationships, because that's what the true community is. If you've ever walked through a neighborhood, you see a nice park. If nobody's in the park, it doesn't really create a community without people being there using it. So I just want to emphasize what Jenna Erickson was saying, that it's those human relationships that need to be strong and need to be fostered 
in order to have this sense of true community and, and true strong family units. And, and it relates to another clip, the, our, our third and, and final previous episode clip I want to share is from an episode where we talked with Brad Wilcox about his recently released book called Get Married. Because again, it's not just the physical attributes, but real community that comes from families with strong relationships. And what Brad says in this clip we'll watch here in a second is that if we can foster communities with these actual strong relationships, intact families, that will help other families to be that way. There's kind of a a contagion effect. So we want to make sure that we don't ever lose sight of how our various policy or community interventions can or should actually help to foster those true family relationships. Let's listen to this clip from a previous episode with Brad Wilcox. It's in the community kind of surrounding yourself with people who are committed to their marriages and their families. And if you do that, and it often happens in religious context, but not always, if you do that, you're more likely, there's you know very clear evidence, for instance, that divorce is socially transmitted. So if you're surrounded by people who are divorced um, or divorcing, you're more likely to get divorced, way more likely. And Chris like I said, Yale's found this. By contrast, if your friends are stably married and kind of more family oriented, your odds of divorce, you know, fall precipitously. So I think it's just kind of being strategic about kind of, you know, understanding that you're that you are your friends in important ways. And so pick wisely and, and spend time with people who are going to be good for you, your spouse, and your family. On the public policy angle, just to recognize and appreciate that there are cultural and economic steps that we can take, which I articulate in the book, things like, you know, pursuing the success sequence in our public schools. And um, on the policy front, you know, pursuing a child tax credit that is going to make family life easier for people who are raising children, especially people who are um, working and married as well. Um, And then the final thing that I would say is that our elites who often benefit themselves personally from strong marriages and families need to do more in a sense to sort of share the good news. And so if you're a school superintendent, you know, for instance, of a large public school district, odds are you're in a decent marriage, maybe a great marriage. You're relatively affluent. You're benefiting from, you know, this sort of inheritance of, of Western family traditions. You could share that, kind of that inheritance with the students in your district. If you're a Hollywood, um, you know, producer or director, um, you could, you know, in a decent relationship, a marriage, you know, um, you could do more to, you know, to, to share that, um, the wisdom that is associated with uh, a marriage to a broader public audience. I talk in the book, for instance, about Reed Hastings, who's the co-founder of Netflix, um, he, in his in his autobiography, he talks about how he and his wife hit a rough spot because he was traveling a lot for his work, and she thought that he was he was too work centered. <laughs> surprise, surprise! The big entrepreneur that he was, um, and so they went to marital counseling and they worked through these issues. They've gone on to have a marriage that's extended more than thirty years, two kids, the whole nine yards. Um, and yet, his platform, I think, in many ways, is not kind of advancing the kinds of values and virtues. And I'm not looking for some kind of like treacly rose colored thing, but I think just sort of to be even more honest. So they had this big, you know, movie um, called marriage story on with this and marriage story tells the tale of, of two kind of cultural professionals in New York and Los Angeles who have a son and over kind of like petty disagreements and professional tensions about how they're going to navigate work and family end up getting divorced for what to my mind is really like, there's no real reason that they should have gotten divorced. And so it ends up kind of painting a very dispiriting portrait of marriage in kind of the upper middle class in America today. Now the problem with this, this movie in part is it's not even realistic, right? Because we're actually seeing in the real upper middle class is that divorce has fallen markedly since 1980. Most upper middle class Americans are getting married and they're staying married. Why couldn't they tell a true marriage story about that group of people um, for Netflix? So this is the lost opportunity. And so I, would, I just hope that our elites would do a better job of kind of using the influence and power that they have to um, both advance marriage um, and just tell the truth. We wanted to share those clips to connects some of the dots, essentially, with some of the things that, that Tim said in the interview and some of the things he says in his book, with these same concepts popping up in previous episodes and a lot of the things that we're talking about here at Southern Institute through our Defending Ideas podcast. Because 
if we can essentially help all of us to be able to reorient how we think about our state, our community, our public policies in a way that elevates the family as, again, that core foundational institution, that'll be really beneficial for parents and kids. And that's a consistent theme of a lot of these experts that we've talked with that keep on seeing the same need pop up in multiple different areas of public life and of public policy. So to that to that extent, there's one last thing I want to mention, and, and that's that in so many ways, Utah is actually a bright spot on this issue. We've talked in past episodes about the Utah family miracle, as, as we've kind of come to call it, because of some of our past research on that issue, showing that Utah bucks the trend in many ways compared to other states and the national average with respect to strong, healthy, happy families. And that ties into the last clip I want to share with you guys today and talk through is from his 2022 State of the State Address, Governor Spencer Cox of Utah, rightly identifies Utah's strong families as really one of the most foundational components of our success as a state. And he also outlines some ways to improve and build upon that. In a new Broadway show, one of the main characters says this line, happy families only exist in orange juice commercials in Utah. (laughs) Tonight, I am proposing a new position that will make Utah parents and children its singular priority. We currently have programs focused on providing necessities for families that are poor or in need, but we must do more to make sure families of all shapes and sizes and makeups are thriving, including parental leave, access to high quality childcare, and mentoring opportunities for parents. The purpose of this office is not to inject more government into families. It is the exact opposite. It is to make sure that government policies are not harming families and that we are coordinating government services to help parents and children succeed. I firmly believe that Utah's success in recent years can be directly attributed, not to our governor and legislature, but to our family-centric identity. And yes, that includes our nation-leading marriage and birth rates. In fact, that has always been part of what makes Utah unique, strong, and resilient. After decades of so-called experts warning the world about overpopulation, now the best and the brightest correctly cite a low and declining birth rate as a major risk facing human civilization. But the risks to our society in abandoning the family are not just macro in scale. This issue touches on the things that matter most in the world. We know that the family the basic and most fundamental unity, uh, unit of our society continues to be the most effective and least expensive place to solve problems. When families are healthy and happy, society benefits. Again, that was from the 2022 State of the State Address from Utah Governor Spencer Cox. And there's a couple things to pinpoint there. Number one, he echoes that sentiment that the family is the most basic fundamental unit of society. And it's very important to make sure that families are thriving, parents and kids are healthy and happy to the extent that we can help that come to pass because it improves things downstream for those families and for our state as a whole. But also, if you fast forward from that couple years to now, The Office of Families, which is what he was initially announcing that speech, has now been formalized into state law, and also a number of other family-friendly policies have been moving forward, again, with this overall goal of elevating the family institution itself as a really important anchor for our society. So all that, I think, trickles down to what are the main takeaways for each of us from this interview with Tim, from his new book, and from all of these conversations we've been having about the importance of families and family policy in general. There are three key things that I think are takeaways for you and I. Number one, if you're a parent, focus on what's truly important, your relationship with your kids, your time with your kids, and showing them how much you love them through those quality interactions that often is better found in those unstructured moments. We don't need to always program every minute of our kids, is what Tim is saying in our interview and in his book. But really view it as that quality parental time is really vital. That was really striking for me as a parent, honestly, that as as we're raising our two young boys, reminding ourselves of those unstructured sort of organic moments together as a family and also those moments we have with the folks in our neighborhood and our community. So there's some really good reminders in that interview with Tim and in his book about essentially some parenting tips for each of us. And then number two, if you're an employer, think about ways that you can make work more family-friendly as opposed to trying to do things the other way around. 
Tim referenced the quote that we've referenced a few times on the show from Richard Reeves about trying to make families more work-friendly, whereas we should be making work more family-friendly. And I think employers will be surprised at how much that opens up in terms of opportunities for filling workforce shortages, for employee morale, employee retention. There are a lot of people, and we've talked about in the past with data and interviews, that are looking to engage in the workforce in some way, but not necessarily at the expense of their family life. But there are a lot of innovative ways to balance those two things in a way that really elevates families and parental time with kids. And then lastly, number three, if you're a policymaker, the basic goal should be every time there's a policy that comes across your desk that you are considering in whatever capacity it is that you serve, ask this question. Would this help the actual institution of the family itself in some way or not? Does it make our society more family friendly, uh, more friendly toward forming families and toward raising kids? Or does it maybe seem to go in the opposite direction? I think those are important questions that can help form and frame so many of the, of the discussions we have as a state, as a country, about public policy, but also just about our culture and our society to make sure that we're really orienting towards the things that matter most. And one of those is the health and strength of our families here in Utah and throughout the nation. I think that'll do it for this episode of Defending Ideas. I want to remind you that if you liked what you heard, please visit DefendingIdeas.org. You can also watch the YouTube version of this episode and previous shows at the Sutherland Institute YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe, and if you hit the little bell icon, you'll be notified each time a new video is released. And also subscribe to Defending Ideas on any of the major podcast platforms, wherever you listen, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Just go to your favorite platform, search for Defending Ideas, and hit subscribe. And also, if you want to read Tim Carney's new book, Family Unfriendly, We'll include a link to that in the show notes as well. I want to thank all of you for spending some time with us here on Defending Ideas. From the Sutherland Institute in Salt Lake City, I'm Nick Dunn. We'll see you next time.